The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to worship this morning, our second Sunday back. And I see we're all nicely spaced out in the pews and uh, ready for worship on this second Sunday after the Festival of Pentecost. This begins that long season of green on the altar, and that will take us all the way uh, through the end of the church year. We're gathered this morning for a service of the Word. We're, we'll be following divine service setting number three. And, uh, oh, we do not have the screen, so we will be working off of the bulletin this morning. In our prayers, we continue to pray for Gerhard Riemer. Gerhard is at Buffalo General Hospital and uh, trying to regain some strength. We also are adding to our prayers Linda Elliott, and she is the cousin of Karen and Larry Fuller, and she has heart issues, and we add her to our prayers. Please stand as we begin worship by singing hymn 790. Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, 
this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
You shall be my treasure, possession among all peoples, for all the earth, for all the earth is mine. And you shall, and you shall be to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from Romans, beginning at chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But should God chose his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. <clears throat> more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, if sin came into the world through one man, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death resigned from Adam, reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over those, even those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, was a type of the one who was to come, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For many, many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God. And the free spirit, by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let your peace return to you. 
And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak the spirit of your father speaking through you. This is the gospel of the Lord. We speak together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From death he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Please be seated as we sing hymn 571.
in light of the passage from Romans chapter 5. Lori tells the story of when she was young, her family lived in an apartment, and they had a dog. There was no yard for this dog to run in, so they would leash the dog and give him the run of the rooftop of the building. One day while they were away, the dog ran right off the edge of the roof and was left swinging from his leash, half choking and very angry. When neighbors saw this, they reached out to save that hanging dog, but he wouldn't cooperate with them. He tried to bite them every time they tried to pull him in. In spite of his lack of cooperation, they managed to get him back to safety, and that was the last time he roamed the rooftop unsupervised. While he had been unable to do anything for himself, the grace of the rescuers pulled him to safety, and they saved his life. St. Paul says, while we were weak, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God himself, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So three times at the beginning of this passage, St. Paul confesses our utter helplessness, even our hostility toward the God of peace who made us. And yet, God voluntarily died to save us. When all of these realities are placed together, it couldn't be any clearer that our salvation is God's work alone, without any help from so our text from St. Paul's letter to the Romans this morning suggests, at least to me, that we should meditate on three questions. First of all, what is at the core of this weakness in us? And what is it about Jesus' death that so powerfully revives us and reconciles us to God? And then thirdly, can this free gift reconcile us to each other in light of what's going on in our cities at this time. St. Paul asserts that this mystery of our salvation begins with sin coming into the world through one man. And as this one man, Adam, sinned, all of us have sinned, and that just doesn't seem fair. How can it be that the sinful act of one man so long ago means that we all sin, even though none of us were born sin. Well, the implication of many passages from Scripture is that Adam, who is the father of us all, shares his human nature with all of his descendants. When he sinned and turned away from the holiness to which God had called him, all human nature became corrupt. Despising God's righteousness, selfishly pursuing sin, suffering bitterness and shame. And this perversion of our character is the fatal flaw in the nature of all of mankind. And so it is that David in the Old Testament confesses that he was brought forth in iniquity. And that the wicked go astray from birth, they're even estranged from God in the womb. St. Paul tells the Ephesians that they were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And Job, back in the Old Testament, judges that all of, in all of mankind, nobody can bring a clean thing out of an unclean. We've come to call this human problem original sin. And scripture convicts us of its reality. None of us can boast that we have an original righteousness because it just isn't there. This is why Jesus being born of the Virgin Mary is so significant. Jesus is not conceived of Adam's nature at all, but as we said, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Although Jesus receives human nature from his mother, there is no corruption to be found anywhere. He is begotten not of Adam, but of God. And as we said last week, remember that complicated passage of the Athanasian Creed. Jesus is made human 
like us, not by any reduction in his divinity, but by the assuming of our humanity into his divinity. So he's human in every way, even tempted just the way we are, and yet he's without any sin, without any hostility toward God, without any corruption in his human nature. Now as sinners, we're just naturally weak, we're mortal. Death enters the world through sin, and we all die because we're all infected with sin. We say that we love God, but we'll turn against him. We'll follow the path of sin instead of receiving, trusting, and embracing that good path set before Adam. This is the core of our weakness. There is an enmity with God's righteousness, and that kills our relationship with him, and we cannot restore it by our own power. For none of us can bring a clean thing out of this unclean thing that we have inherited. One consequence of that unclean nature is right now in America, we're suffering something that, just like sin, we didn't actually create, but which we continue to live in. The reason we have these racial inequities in our nation, it's not the creation of our particular generation. It dates back hundreds of years to the unjust, unrighteous, selfishly sinful idea that one group of people could enslave another group of people, taking away their freedom, their dignity, their names, and their families, all for their own benefit of turning a profit in this newly discovered world. This ancient evil, though, has never been extinguished. Though these enslaved people were released by legislation, they were still here because of the essential greed and inhumanity of earlier generations. Were they made whole at the time of their emancip emancipation? No, not really. They were made free, but free to be poor. They were technically free, but the damage has never been undone. They were never given the hand of fellowship. They found themselves in a social enslavement instead. And that evil has haunted this land of the free and the brave ever since. Our cities burned in the 60s because of it. They burned again in the 90s because of it. And they threatened to burn again in this millennium because it is an infection that has never healed. Now, I don't consider myself to be the cause of this problem, but I'm caught it up in it just like all of us are. It's going to take a reconciliation through the grace of God to overcome it in any fashion. I grew up in the city of Rochester, but my first exposure to black people came at a very early age, not in the city, but in the country, on my grandparents' farm in the small town of Hamlin, New York. Way down the lane, there was this really small, beat-up shack, kind of like a wooden box with a porch on it. And there were some strange men in ragged clothing sitting on the porch in front of it. Who are they, Grandma? I asked. Now I know that they were migrant farm workers. Those were not the words my grandma used to describe them. She had not created that unequal situation, but she was certainly part of it. And kind of oddly, a few years later, she loaned me a book that she had just read about the Underground Railroad in western New York. By actual familiarity with black people as people, started in my school days in the city of Rochester, when we went from no black kids in our classes to a few through open enrollment, and then a lot more through a mandatory busing. And let me tell you, it was not easy. The evil went unresolved. 
My senior year of high school was so rough that the city schools were exempted from the regents exams because they could not ensure the safety of the students. Now, I really feel like we have come a long, long ways in race relations in this country. But the original evil still remains. We have inherited something that infects us. We don't want to put people down. We feel badly that they're treated differently because of the color of their skin. But we find ourselves helpless to solve a problem that is rooted in our sinful natures. We cannot make right of this wrong because we're part of it, like it or not. In a secular world, we have not reconciled this trespass that's in our nature. And yet, the free gift of salvation is not anything like the trespass. And the gift of reconciliation with God gives us hope for our reconciliation with each other. Adam's sin brings us all into sin. But when Jesus dies and rises, he does it on our behalf. The free gift of his grace is not like the trespass that imprisons humanity in death. Instead, it releases us into a joyful life with God in which Jesus already abides. So how can Jesus' death and resurrection accomplish this? How does one man's activity, no matter how righteous, make up for the unrighteousness of others? Adam's fall led to his own corruption. And his place as the father of all of us means the communication of this sinful nature has reached all of his descendants. But Jesus communicates his righteousness to us in a very spiritual and in a very supernatural way through the gift of baptism. In baptism, you and I are born again of water and the Spirit. In baptism, we become children begotten of God. In the gift of faith, he communicates this nature to us. By God's Spirit, that old nature in us is put to death. And we are daily born again into a new nature, the pure, living, immortal nature of Jesus by whom all of us have life. All who believe and are baptized are begotten of God. We're all restored to life, and we become reconciled to God through Jesus. Although we were once enemies, although we were sinners going against God's will, Christ died for us. And the old nature of sin, this heritage of Adam, dies with Christ at the in his resurrection, we rise to a new life. So in the gift of baptism, Christ overcomes our sinful nature, and he gives us a brand new nature in his spirit. This is who we are now in Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer locked in enmity with God and with each other. In Christ, in this faith that we have been called to, we are now brothers and sisters with everyone who is in Christ. This is where our hope for reconciliation with each other lies. Our sinful past has been wiped clean. And we have now been judged righteous because we have been made righteous by the pouring out of Christ's blood and by his death. So let us rejoice in God through Christ. Let us be unafraid to seek reconciliation, even over and against past evils. Let us give praise to our Father who has rescued the children of Adam and given us a new heritage together as his children. All this, all this he has done by his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory forever and ever.
congregation, please stand as we sing the offering.
that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.